thank you so much for agreeing to have us interview you. We're super excited about all the work that you're doing and we're all really big admirers. Um, and so sort of along that line, you're doing really incredible work applying machine learning to some of the greatest problems in cosmology and astrophysics. And so I guess like, why does astrophysics excite you? And along these lines, what sorts of questions fascinate you the most? Yeah, so I, I guess this is very typical. Um, I, I grew up as a kid going to space museum and science museum, thanks to my parents. Um, so I guess that was how I got interested. And I grew up in a city and there isn't any night sky in the city and it kind of becomes much more of a mystery. It kind of adds to the beauty to it. And for the questions, what interests me and what interests me and fascinates me the most, I think is the fundamental questions of, you know, how did everything begin? Like what happened when it began? The universe, I mean, and what happened since then to, you know, forming our own galaxy, our own planets. And it kind of relates to the philosophical question of why are we here? It links all the way from cosmology to, I guess, planet formation, galaxy formation, planet formation, and why do we get here? I guess somewhat evolution too, but really it's a existential philosophical drive actually at some level. Yeah, that's great. Um, I also grew up in the city and so... Really you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I totally know what you mean. Um, the first time I saw a night sky was in New Mexico, like the real night sky with all the stars and it was kind of breathtaking yeah yeah and i think that <laughs> that makes a lot of sense as to like why you saw that and you're like this is the thing that i want to do yeah definitely um okay so then along that lines like we talked about astrophysics maybe let's like talk about the machine learning side um so your group is using ml to gain insights into the large scale structures that make up our universe um and so could you talk a little bit about that Sure, sure. Large scale structure of the universe really means looking at the universe at a relatively large scale. So when I mean large scales, we're talking about millions of light years, like really large scales. That includes webs of galaxies that interconnected with each other in the form of something called a cosmic web. Um, and they include these, you can imagine like metropolitan cities, these called big clusters of galaxies, many, many galaxies you know, clump together and then it's filaments, these like, I guess, highways linking from one city to another with all these suburbs. If you see like night sky of earth from the space and look down, there's this web of interconnections. If you look, turn this telescope up into the night sky, you actually see these interconnections also, but these are connected galaxies of webs of galaxies sliding up. And that's this large scale structure of the universe. Um, from data wise, we really use data coming from beginning of the universe, like the leftover radiation of the Big Bang. We call it the baby footprint of the universe, very, very beginning, I know. And the large telescope that's staring into the night sky at the galaxies themselves. Um, I will think of this as like a photo album of the universe when the baby is born, like the microcosmic background is very early, it's like really like baby footprint early. And then as a teenager, which is the last few billion years, and then as a adult, which is right now. And we have all these photo albums and we use them to understand how did the baby sort of get there in the first way? How did the universe begin? What was it like at the beginning? And what changes this universe and what's in there and what will happen in the future? So that's the study of larger structure of the universe and how to make it up that larger structure. And how do we use machine learning to do it? Um, we use machine learning in many, many different ways. I can talk about in multiple directions, but the most exciting thing that we've recently been using machine learning for is to do use deep learning to accelerate the simulation of the entire universe. And so that once you can do that, you can vary what are the initial conditions or the latent parameters of the universe, like what's making up the universe and all that stuff and forward it all the way to now as an adult and compare to the picture you see and figure out what's at the beginning, what's in the middle, and everything about the universe. And it wasn't possible before. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I think the analogy that you talked about is such a good way to 
explain it to uh, to a layperson. I feel like I really understood it. So that was great. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And like, so it's really cool that you're talking, I guess, like about how deep learning has been able to accelerate that process in recent years. Um, moving to like now, I guess, your recent work, um, you have a really cool preprint out, which is applying CNNs, uh, convolutional neural networks, to establish a mapping between the 3D galaxy distribution and its underlying dark matter distribution. And that sounds so cool. So could you talk a little bit more about that project in particular and how it um, relates to the rest of the body of your work? Yeah, so remember that's like baby pictures, you know, this photo album. And in order to make this photo of the adult, we have to sort of go into something a little simpler. So in this case, the backbone of the universe or the backbone of this adult is made of dark matter and dark matter interacts gravitationally. So we can model these dark matter interactions really, really well, um, or what we think the dark matter is candidates doing. And once we can accelerate those dark matter simulations, we can make them run instead of like 30 million CPU seconds, we can run it in milliseconds. Right, so now we can use deep learning to make it run really, really fast. And I get these huge, nice dark matter maps of high resolution then can I make them look like galaxies? Because now we have the backbone of the universe and we have to sort of drop down all the galaxies on it. And what we did is that we took a really very expensive and very complex um, large simulations of hydrodynamic simulations, which includes gravity and hydrodynamics, which has created galaxies. And look at that simulations and look at what a, we could have run it without the hydrodynamics and then learn the mapping between the two. And machine learning is great at learning high dimensional mapping or interpolation from dark matter to galaxies. So now we have this mapping from, if you have a dark matter map, you have a galaxy map. Well, I see, yeah, that makes, that makes sense. And I think uh, what you talked about, especially with regards to like the amount of feature space that you have, um, it makes a lot of sense why deep learning would be such a good tool for it. Um, yeah, and so I guess you've talked a lot now about, I guess, like the advantages of deep learning, but now maybe we can move to the challenges. So I guess, like, what are the largest challenges that you face at the intersection of machine learning and cosmology in terms of the model architectures, the representations, the data, the, the computational power, just anything at all? It will be more sociological, surprisingly. <laughs> um, because it is a fairly new field still, I remember probably about three-ish years ago, I gave a talk about how we can use deep learning to accelerate these you know, dark matter simulations of gravity. And one of my friends was sitting in the audience and he later on told me how all these people are saying that how are you using these black boxes to try to understand this black box universe, right? Because we don't understand dark energy or dark matter, which is like 95% of the universe is unknown. And using this dark, black boxes to understand dark stuff. Um, so the field of intersection between deep learning and cosmology have changed dramatically over the last few years, but it's still, I think a significant majority of the field still finds it difficult to believe the results we have achieved. We've been working very hard to make them believe us. And I think it's definitely made huge headways, but the, every time we present a result, people will always be super interested in interpretation of why it works and how to interpret deep learning, I think it's uh, one of the biggest challenge for the scientist because they want to know why it works. It's not just how it works, but also why it works. And getting interpretability, I think will be a biggest challenge to satisfy the scientific community. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I work with a lot of healthcare data and it's a very similar type of challenge where you get a result and then chemists or biologists are like this doesn't make any sense <laughs> until you tell me why so there's definitely um yeah a need for greater interpretability in the field and i think that's very also medical right i guess imagine if you run this for insurance estimates like premium estimates and you say okay this person will have high premium and this person has lower premium but you can't tell why then insurance companies gonna come after you this yeah. is more practical <laughs> definitely yeah so i think um, interpretive, so would you say like interpretability, I guess like does the interpretability of 
cosmology differ from the interpretability of the remaining of like the rest of the ML community or are they or do, does one depend on the other? I think they intertwined. Um, if we can understand, say, how a why convolutional neural network or how a why graphical neural network works better in certain ways, for example, it would apply to many different things, not just cosmology. The scientists will have a slightly different swing on, you know, what is more important. First of all, you know, interpreting the results, but interpreting, say, I find a relationship, I find a mapping. What is that mapping, right? Now, now I just said, you can map from dark matter to galaxies, but what is the mapping? I give you a hundred, or maybe not a hundred million, but maybe like 10 million neurons, and I can do that mapping, but that doesn't explain anything. So for scientists, I think it'd be more interesting to go from the mapping itself that you can get to get really good predictions to uh, an analytical equation, or maybe to understanding of why that happens. And I believe that will also help generalization you know, outside of the data set, if these mappings are truly fundamental. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think it'll definitely be able to accelerate the field going forward. Um, so along those lines, like what really excites you about the field in the future? And what are you looking forward to seeing? I'm really already giving out all the answers because I suggested uh, interpretability of the um, machine learning applied to science or not. I mean, in the end, I think it will make a lot of people much happier if machine learning is, using, is being used to you know, help doctors make diagnosis and you have no idea why it says you have 2% of getting whatever in the future. Um, and it also helps in scientifically speaking, what I just said, it might help generalization if you can interpret the results and understand maybe leading to an analytical equation and then further understanding, it will help generalizing outside of the training data set distribution, maybe. Um, and that relates to, I think, representation learning a little bit about how that is interpreting, have interpretations depending on the representation that the network is learning also. So I think that that's all gonna be super exciting if we can work on that. I think so too. <laughs> yeah. We can um, work on that together. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Um, okay, so slightly taking a pivot, um, you've worked at both the Flatiron Institute and as a professor at Carnegie Mellon, both super awesome places. Um, so how has your experience on a research institute team differed from the research that you conduct in academia and more traditional university settings? And how have you sort of gone in between those spheres? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I find myself extremely lucky. I had great students and I actually love teaching, not to boast, but I actually enjoy teaching. I think a lot of students enjoy the classes that I taught, but I always had taught fairly small classes, so I might be biased. So at Carnegie Mellon, I taught classes and I enjoyed it. It was excellent place to do a lot of interdisciplinary research that are probably not possible with a larger institution. So Carnegie Mellon was smaller enough and we also have something called, um, what's that called? The McWilliams Center for Cosmology, where we have both machine learners, statisticians, and physicists all in the same center. And we all talk to each other. It was sort of already there when I arrived and we just keep building it up. And even to this day, I still work with some of the people after I moved you know, to different institutions and come back to uh, Flatiron at the end. And Flatiron is sort of a dream come true for a lot of I think many of us who are academics or scientists, because we encourage and allow to pursue whatever we find is most exciting and interesting and take risks, that position that requires funding, in this case, like a professorship, was have you know grant application for student support or postdoc support, that makes it harder to pursue something that might be a bit higher risk or have a longer term turnaround. So I, I find Flatiron to be excellent in the sense of freedom and in the sense of support to take a bit more risk. And the interdisciplinary is definitely there too because we have these many different computational um, centers and we all talk to each other using similar tools sometimes actually. Yeah, that sounds really, really awesome. And especially because you know, you're sort of in between um, and in the center of so many fields. 
Um, it must be really cool to get to work with people from all these places and sort of be uh, at like the front of that, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I was very interested to see, you know, we do something with graphical neural net and how we extract an equation from the graphical neural net that learned from a, a bunch of data. And we realized, oh, we can do that possibly with molecules because we know someone in biology. Yeah, so. yeah, that's so cool that you're able to like find those connections. And I think, you know, that's really how um, great research is done. So that's awesome. I feel like I'm not going to be Einstein or whatever, you know, so it's interesting to do what's best. And I find myself thriving in sort of interdisciplinary and making connections with different new stuff. And I, I think I enjoy being in an interdisciplinary area as well you get to meet everybody and get to discover all these new things from a different perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so um, again, pivoting. Um, I really wanna talk about how you got started in machine learning and how you got started in astrophysics and sort of your background in general. So if you would just uh, mind telling us about that, I think we'd really like to hear it. How far back do you wanna go? Um, as far back as you want to. Um, I guess for astrophysics, I've always been interested, as I was saying, as a kid. Um, I wasn't sure what I, I want to be a mathematician or physicist or astrophysicist, but you know, the nerdy views, which is I'm very proud of. Uh, and then at some point at Berkeley, I think we were doing computer science and physics. Oh, by the way, yes, I have tiger parents. So when I said I wanted to do only astrophysics, they said you need to do something useful. So I said, okay, fine, I'll do computer science in addition. So I did a double major and it was great. I mean, in the end, it turned out fine. <laughs> but uh, thanks to my tiger parents, then I had to learn computer science and, uh, and I actually liked it, um, mostly in theoretical computer science. So not so much in you know, getting the network to work, honestly. Um, but it allowed me to have the opportunity to have the same language. I think that I can pick up very quickly when I was moving between the fields. And so then I went into astrophysics, which is what I loved as a PhD student in Princeton. And I just kept, you know, realizing how important it is to speak those languages, even in computer science, because you end up doing a lot of data analysis with the large data set that came online with all this Teflon telescope. I think the social media had the same situation where you have a lot of data all of a sudden just coming in to play. And same thing with science and in particular astronomy had a huge amount of improvement in amounts of data we just collected because of CCD cameras. They're very cheap often, same time as we take pictures on the phone. Um, and so then the computer science got really useful. And when I went to Carnegie Mellon as a faculty, I just was in this, um, you know, McWilliam Center for Cosmology, which gathers its ML stat and cosmologists and really encourage interactions and collaboration between all the different disciplines. We just really had lots of good discussions. And I really started ML because of a Christmas party. I think my friends brought a couple of really cool ML scientists um, into the party and it just told us like the coolest thing over drinks. Okay, I'm not encouraging drinking necessarily, but that Christmas party definitely started my interest for real and really built up some friendship in machine learning. And that's way all got started. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Good to Go to parties, I guess. That's <laughs> the lesson. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. <laughs> I'll definitely take your advice on that. <laughs> I think MIT would, would be good if more people go to parties. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So like sort of along those lines, um, for students who are interested in learning more about machine learning or astrophysics or even just like the intersection between the two do you have any thoughts about where students should start like should they start on the theory side or the applied side um or should they do both um, i think they yeah. just start doing research just do the research right away um you can always learn more and i find myself learning a lot better when i do research on it or you teach it um, I think there's no other ways to learn it. Like sort of in the bones, like you really had to overcome some difficulties and doing research really challenges. I mean, for me, at least really challenges me and I think it helps a lot in like drilling it in my brain what's happening. So do research. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree with that. I feel like the things that have come out of 
and I feel like I understand the best of the things that I'm either actively doing research on or I've been a TA for. So yeah. Well, Otherwise, just left ear here and right ear out. I mean, I I remember as a student, that's what happened. Yep, I can confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, as a last question, um, do you have any advice for younger students who are interested in the field? I think it's a really exciting field and many things haven't been quite worked on. Um, at least in the interdisciplinary field that I've looked into, like there's so many low hanging fruits that, you know, a lot of the work, like the work you mentioned about, you know, convolution internet to go from dark matter to the connection with galaxies seems so cool. But, you know, it's done by an undergrad who slat the work. So, and he just happened to be doing a summer internship with me. So I, I think set your goals high, dream big, and don't be afraid to try to start doing research somewhere. You can do really great things. Think as long as you want to do it and just really push hard. I get a, a bit gumption and dream a bit bigger. Well, that's great advice. And I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah, this was great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.